Okay, we're ready. Okay. This is to call the monthly meeting of the Wilmot Board of Trustees on Tuesday, August 18th at 6 p.m. Can we have a roll, roll call? Trustee Barshes. Absolutely. Trustee Barshes, yes. Trustee Fishman? Here. here. Trustee Johnson? I'm here, thank you. Trustee Riddle? Yeah, buddy. Absent. Trustee Rogers? Here. Trustee Wolf? Here. Trustee Wolf, you're there, I know. I, yeah, here. If you didn't hear me, I'm here. You hear me? Hello? You hear me? Jan? You hear me? Yeah. Okay. I think my computer went out. Oh, okay. I'm here. Hello. Okay. And okay. Trustee McDonald? I'm here. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Barshies. At this time, it is, uh, we would just like to note, note who's here in terms of uh, visitors. We have from the Observation Corps of the League, Mary Lawler and Georgia Gephardt. We have uh, staff, John Risco, Mart Marty, Gail Justman, and Jessica Thompson. And does anyone have anything that they would like to say at this time? This is going in and out. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Barring no public comment at this time. Okay. Can we, review the, we would like to review the draft of the, min, of the minutes from July 21st, 2020. They are with attachment one. A motion approval of those meetings, minutes? A second. Okay. Is there, Trustee Wolf has moved to approve the minutes from July 21st, 2020, and Trustee Barshis has seconded the motion. Yeah, are there any, is there any, is there, are there, is there any discussion? I'd just like to acknowledge whoever uh, drafted him did a nice job, uh, and I appreciate sort of uh, whoever did it, including the discussion, so thank you. You're welcome, thank you for the comment, okay. Anything else? Okay. Can we have the vote? Do you mind taking the vote? This, we move to a vote on adopting the July 21st, 2020 minutes of the regular board meeting with Trustee Wolf making the motion and uh, motion and Trustee Barshi seconding the motion. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshi, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. At this time, there are no presentations, so we will turn it over to the treasurer, Trustee Rogers, and for the financial reports and the bill and salary detail behind attachment two and three. Okay, um, uh, July, as is uh, often the case, uh, was the beginning of our tax receipts. Tax bills were due August 1st. We received uh, about $740,000 in tax receipts, $12,000 in general fund interest, $7,800 in replacement taxes, and there's one additional revenue item um, in the middle of the page, uh, we received 16,784 and change from the Winnetka Library um, as a year end adjustment. Rogers, I'm gonna interrupt you there. We did not receive that money. We, dis we dispersed that money. That's not revenue, that was an expenditure. Okay, all right. So we sent money to Winnetka then. And I assume then that that's a result of the apportionment based on circulation? That is correct. Okay. Um, all right. There are no extraordinary expenses in the first of month of the year. There are some that are in quotes over budget simply because 
of when certain um, expenses uh, occur. Um, there's nothing else unusual in the uh, in the financial um, report that you have. If there are any questions, we can certainly entertain those. Um, Barring any questions, I move approval of the July bills and salaries, which is in the attachment immediately behind the uh, financial summary. I'll second. Uh, Lisa, you're muted. You're muted, Lisa. Trustee Rogers has approved. Uh, has moved to approve the bills and salaries for July 2020 behind attachment three and trustee Wolf has seconded it. Is it the motion? Is there any discussion or questions? No. Okay, it's been moved and moved by trustee Rogers and seconded by trustee Wolf that the bills and salaries for July 2020 be, uh, be approved. Can we have a vote please? Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Tr and Trustee Wolf? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. Moving on to the next action item. It's ordinance number 2020-21 197 the annual budget and appropriation ordinance for library purposes for the fiscal year 2021. The ordinance was passed in tentative form at the July 21st, 2020 meeting of the board. I'm gonna turn it over to Trust Director Austin and Trustee Rogers. Hey, this is the second step in the process of moving through our required financial documents. The uh, budget and appropriation ordinance is the authorization to spend any funds that we anticipate uh, during the coming fiscal year. Uh, it is not an obligation to spend all of those funds, uh, but we have to adopt an appropriation that provides the authority should we need to, uh, to do so. Um, it also is a requirement for us to expend any of the funds that are in the tax levy, which is step three in this process. We will be uh, looking at the tax levy probably at our September meeting, um, and it has to be adopted uh, by early December. We generally adopt uh, the levy um, in September or October. Um, I move approval of uh, ordinance number 2020-21-197, uh, the uh, tentative combined annual budget and appropriation ordinance. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, Trustee Rogers has moved approval of ordinance number 2020-21-197 for fiscal year 2021. And Trustee Wolf has seconded it. Is there some discussion? Sure. Any questions? Okay. Good. Given none, uh, I'm the motion. Can we have a vote on the motion to approve the passing of the ordinance number 2020-21-197 for the combined annual budget and appropriation ordinance for library purposes for the fiscal year 2020-2021. Trustee Barshis, can we do a roll call? Give me Absolutely. A Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. Trustee Riddle? Absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. 
Okay. It's been moved. Uh, Lisa, you're muted. You hear me. It's been moved and moved by uh, a vote of five to one of the seven of the six trustees that voted and passed. Thank you. Uh, we ha have behind, uh, also you have attachment five, you have the Illinois State Annual Report, and we see this every year. And so, Anthony, would you like to talk about the annual report? It's a good summary of what the library has done with the statistics, the staffing, and it's just a good record of what has happened in the last year. Right. Um, so the IPLAR, the Illinois Public Library Annual Report, is um, the major statistical collection um, for the library. And most of the data that's included in this report gets reported to the Public Library Service collection um, that is reported nationally and helps to inform statistical trending for the industry. So it's a very important piece of our, of our annual procedures. Um, it is also a contingency for the receipt of the annual per capita grant. Um, and makes us eligible for a number of other um, programs within the state. So it is a requirement and we have fulfilled that. Um, I will say it was a challenge putting this document together this year um, for a number of reasons, um, not least of which was the fact that our administrative assistant for many years, Cynthia McMillan, has retired and this was one of the roles that she helped to fulfill. So um, we all really missed her work this year, but um, the team came together in very short fashion when it, and was able to collect the information. Um, as you can expect, the data in this report that you're seeing looks certainly different than the trending that we've had in years past, and that is because the final quarter of this uh, fiscal year, 1920, uh, was affected by the pandemic. And as we know, in all of our statistics going forward, there will be a big asterisk next to 2020 um, because it will be an aberration statistically. Um, what I can say is if you were to look at the annual figures for the preceding fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 1819, you will see that um, the numbers for 1920 uh, for the actual dates that we were open were very consistent. Um, so we were trending statistically the same until everything dropped off. The numbers that are, that are less than what you're seeing from the years prior are really due in fact to the closure. Um, I am happy to address any questions that you may have about any specific line items if you want to get into that level of detail. Um, but we have met um, all of our requirements, um, including the minutes audit. I want to thank um, Trustees Fishman and Riddle for going through our minutes binder and confirming that we've uh, fulfilled that, um, the obligation with our minutes. Um, but uh, barring all of that and your approval this evening, um, we will be ready to submit the report um, at your will. So question. Other, take a motion. Just one question, quick. Is this the data that they used to give us the, the rating that we got? this year or is, there, is that different data that they get used? Yeah, so this will also contribute to library journals um, that you're referring to library journals five-star rating that the library right. received earlier this year. Yes, um, this is part of that data collection. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions before we vote on it? Yeah, is this the, um, about the $40,000 we get every year from the state, Anthony, is that what this is for? That is one of the contingencies, yes. The per capita grant, in order to be eligible for that, we need to, we need to pass the, um, the public um, uh, library annual report, yes. And if you have a sense, if you don't, it's fine. About the cost to put this report together in terms of hours, was it marginal, no big deal, significant? Just curious. If you don't know, it's fine. Yeah, I, I can't tell you exactly how many hours it takes to compile the data. Um, you know, a lot of these measures are things that, you know, for example, the circulation data is provided by um, CCS. They are able to provide a report for us, so a lot of that information we can plug in. I think the hardest thing to track comes down to the, the, the actual jobs, um, titles of the people's positions and so on, and tracking the, uh, that data. That has to be done on a line item basis. Um, collecting statistics about um, the training programs that we've done over the year and so on. Um, I, I would say it's really cumulatively no more than probably about 15 hours to compile the report. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, is there a motion 
to adopt the Illinois State oh. Library Annual Report for fiscal. A motion to adopt the, uh, the library report. Okay. Is and I'll second. Okay. Trustee Fishman. Thank you. Trustee Wolf uh, moved to adopt the Illinois State Library Annual Report for fiscal year 2019 20. And Trustee Fishman seconded the motion. Is there any other discussion? Can we have a vote to approve the Illinois State Library Annual Report for fiscal year 2019-20? Yes. You. Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes, and the motion passed uh, six uh, affirmations, no nays. Okay, now let's turn to our discussion items. And Anthony has been taking us each through our training, which is one of the requirements that trustees get. And we do one um, a month. And so this month we're doing serving our public 4.0 standards of Illinois Public Libraries review of chapter nine. Anthony. Thank you. Um, so this is also a contingency of our um, receipt of the per capita grant. Um, these, uh, while the rule has not yet been established, it is my understanding that the comprehensive review of uh, serving our public four is going to be a requirement for the receipt of the uh, forthcoming per capita grant. So we are already very well on our way to completing that task. So thank you for setting aside time at each meeting for this. Um, this month's is fun, uh, Reference and Reader's Advisory Services. This is one of the areas where Wilmet Library certainly stands um, very tall. Um, this is one of our signature services. This is the, the direct customer service that you receive at the youth and adult services desks. And um, uh, particularly Reader's Advisory is one of the areas that we very much excel in. Um, I can tell you that we, we meet and exceed all the standards that are listed here. Um, one of the key pieces is, is that they say that all these basic services are available to library patrons when the library is open. And I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of these services are also available when the library is not open. And when the physical library is not open, we are providing these services um, live remotely and can also provide them uh, digitally remotely as well. Um, so I, I think that um, we're doing a fabulous job with this and, and frankly, I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you have about any of the points uh, that are identified in uh, these categories regarding reference and readers advisory. Is there anything that you would like to discuss? Mm -hmm. Number eight talks about newspapers, which we really can't make given the pandemic. Is the policy still not to circulate newspapers at this time? Um, yeah, so this is, this is a bit of a challenge right now. Um, so <laughs> what the library can do is we, we provide access to dozens of newspapers digitally. Um, we've got a number of platforms that make papers available. The library does in fact still collect all of the newspapers that we're subscribing to. However, they're really in the middle of a pandemic. There's not a very safe way to make ephemeral material like a newspaper available to the public safely. Um, we could provide it to a single individual, but the assumption is that we're treating everyone as though they have the virus. So if one person takes the newspaper, reads it, sneezes on it, and sets it aside for the next patron, we can't guarantee that they're going to be, you know, clean or, or that, that, that that product is gonna be safe for the next person to use. So at this time, uh, newspaper newspapers are available for photocopying purposes, librarians can help facilitate that. Uh, we can also provide access to our digital subscriptions to everything. And we're keeping everything as a matter of archive um, within our retention guidelines. Um, periodicals are also available. Um, they're, they're available for circulation. They're just not available for use inside the library. Thank you. Yep. Um, any other questions about um, the standards? There's no action required here, but I'm happy to take any questions that you may still have. If not, we can move on to our next agenda item. Okay, you wanna review the updated pandemic response? First, uh, Director Austin will review the updated pandemic response and reopening plan. 
All right. So thank you. So what I can tell you about the library's reopening is um, we're, we're recapping our data for July right now. And July was, a, was a, an important month for us. It was the first month that we reopened the building. Uh, so on July 13th, the Monday, the library reopened. And on that day, we had 465 people come inside the library. The first hour of the day was our busiest. We had over 50 people come in the, in the building that hour. And ever since that time, we've averaged about 50 people an hour throughout the course of the week. Um, given the fact that um, uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic, it should be expected that our, our door counts have been down. Um, so what I can tell you in comparing data from July of 2019 to July of 2020, our door counts um, are down 80%. Um, we are at 66% of the hours that we would typically have been open um, were we not in the pandemic. So that is a significant reduction in the number of people coming in the building. Um, that said, our circulation numbers are quite, quite rather astounding. Um, in 2019, our circulation in July was just short of 400,000. This July, our circulation was 367,000. So that's just an 8% reduction over last year's physical material circulation. It's pretty amazing. I'm quite proud of the fact that the staff has been able to accomplish that um, and meet that demand. And I think a lot of that is due in part to our parking lot pickup service, as well as um, uh, patrons being able to take advantage of our holds. Um, but browsing has certainly been a big part of our, our draw for circulation this month as well. Digital circulation, as you know, has been booming, and it has been booming since April, May, and June when we saw exponential growth. In July, that growth kind of leveled off, and the st statistics are fairly consistent with where they were um, back in, say, June and, and May, um, but certainly not as strong as they were tipping in, in April. Um, but they doubled. So in uh, 2019 in July, we had 7,600 digital circs, and in 2020, we had just over 14,000. So cumulatively, our total circulation is down just 7% over last year. So we're, we're very excited about that fact. So digital circulation is up 86% over where it was um, previously. Print um, is down 8%. Total circulation is down 8%. Our door count is down 80%. Website usage is flat. And uh, usage of our new app, which has been in play for about a year now, has been up 187%. So a lot of patrons are taking advantage of digital resources. Um, so overall, I think given the conditions of things, um, staff um, are adapting well, and I think patrons are, are responding favorably to the uh, modified environment and adaptations that we've had to make um, given the circumstances. Um, to date, I've really only had one conflict regarding masks and we were able to serve that individual outside. Um, so we, we haven't turned a single person away for service. Um, we just say, look, it's a condition of coming in the library that you need to wear a face covering or, or cloth mask. And if you're unable to do so, we're more than happy to meet you at parking lot pickup or we'll come outside and provide whatever resources that you need there. That's our customer service model. Um, so we've only had to invoke that once. Otherwise, everyone else has been very compliant um, and recognizes that we've made some adaptations in an interest to try to keep everyone healthy and safe. Um, that's kind of in a nutshell where we're at at the moment um, regarding um, our plan, and I'm happy to entertain any questions that you may have about our procedures. Just a quick one, if I may. Um, it's a little uh, silly, but uh, have you guys thought about making any uh, you know, logo, any masks with our logo on it and sell them like we do with the tote bags? That's really an interesting idea. No, we, we actually, that's a, that's a fresh one. I have not heard that. Yeah. I asked you about that, Anthony, I asked you about that before and you said it was, you were concerned about liability. I, I think, you know, in terms of, of guarantees, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, that's an interesting, an interesting mm -hmm. concept. Um, I, I don't I don't know where I where I can take that right now, but um, I, I think it'd be kind of fun if the staff all had them and I imagine some patrons may want to buy them, especially if it's a tiny fundraiser. But just a thought for you guys to think about. It's for us. Yeah, it's, it's for us to think about. It's a great suggestion. Um, I will say that masks really come down to personal preference. 
Um, so I don't know that I could mandate that the staff would all wear one, but if we offered a branded one, they may want to do that. Um, cloth masks are certainly um, different. You know, I, I tend to favor the more surgical style like this. Uh, if I'm in them all day, it's a lot easier to breathe that way. Uh, the cloth ones can be really whimsical and are really fun to have, um, but uh, they can be a little bit harder to breathe in, and if they don't have the metal thing in them, they tend to fall off your face. So anyway, it's, it's a very personal thing for some, but I like the idea. So we can, we can consider that. Thanks, Dan. Um, anything else about our reopening procedures or any questions about the environment that we're in right now? I'll just remark, this is uh, Jan Barshus. I'll just remark that I think that it's been incredible uh, what you've been able to do overall with uh, both the body count that comes into the library physically and with all the digital resources. There's just something for everyone if they want to make uh, use of it. Thank you, that's what we're aiming to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know one of the challenges that we've got ahead of us is trying to anticipate what's going to happen next. And as we've seen with our partners in our local schools, um, planning um, really involves a lot of uh, plan B's, C's, D's, and so on down the list. Um, things can, can change at a moment's notice. Um, it appears statistically that uh, the virus is returning to our communities and is starting to spread a little bit. So yep. definitely keeping an eye on that and, um, and looking, looking ahead um, and seeing what we can do to try to mitigate any of those concerns as they come forward. Thank you. You, had cover, you covered a lot of that in your, uh, your director's report, too, in terms of getting staff prepared in case the shutdown happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can do it again. Okay, any other questions regarding the pandemic reopening? Okay, we had a meeting on August 13th. It was a review of the Capital Reserve Study that was done by Inberg Anderson and a draft is on the website and anthony do you want to just briefly talk about that i i think it's fabulous to have a 20-year summary of what we need and to catalog it all so that we have a good sense of what some of our lives just what's ahead of us i think so. thank you yeah I'm, I'm really satisfied with the results that we received from ingberg anderson and and joe huberty has been a really great partner to work with. Um, I think we got some very valuable information. Um, uh, I think, you know, Rhonda, I might ask you to help me with this summary as well. Um, anyone who was present at the meeting, it'd be great to get some feedback from you to try to summarize and capture everything that we discussed. Um, but very briefly, the, the scope of work for our project was to account for every physical asset that's attached to the building, from replacing the roof all the way down to the geothermal wells, the windows, um, and to mitigate any issues that may be existing with the library and to anticipate any maintenance matters that may be coming forward. Um, again, the context of this is that we're trying to identify um, any capital needs that we're going to have to maintain the building over the course of the next 20 years to keep the building as, as it is today. Um, we're not, this, the capital reserve study is not talking about how we Prove things, it is all about how we can maintain the existing plant of the building. Um, so what we have here is a model and a workbook that identifies um, every element uh, in the building, identifies its current status, um, whether it is in a state of repair, if it's wearing, um, if it's in good condition, um, what the replacement cost of that item is, and then history about it. When was it installed? What is the life of it? And so on down the line. Um, and now we've got essentially a plan that tells us that in order to, to continue to maintain this building, we're going to need to allocate approximately $8 million um, over 20 years in order to sustain the library as it is today. Um, we have been doing this process for many years as part of our special reserve fund, and we have a resolution amending a plan that we look at annually. And that plan historically has allocated about $6, $6 million for a process like this. So we've got a more inclusive plan that, that really gets into the details. And I think it naturally it's, it, would, it would tend to, to trend a little bit higher. And that's why it's at 8 million now. Um, but average wise, um, the, the previous plan was at about $400,000 a year that we would need to allocate towards special reserve product projects. 
and that's essentially what we've seen in, in this project as well. But the big news for us out of this, and I think the more immediate concern that we have, is that there are some life safety matters that are ahead of us here in the very near term. Um, in fact, the overwhelming majority of the work in this plan is called for in the next five years. And the first thing that we've identified and spent a fair bit of time discussing last Thursday um, relates to some electric panels that are spread across the building and really should be consolidated as they don't meet code. So one of the first things that I need to do here is to work with an engineer to identify what the scope of work is in order to get us up to code and then get that, um, that plan ready for presentation so that we can put that um, in an RFP, collect some proposals for that, and then bring that before you all with a recommendation so that we've got a plan to, uh, to get those things mitigated. Um, that process is something we're gonna wanna get out ahead of here pretty quickly, as that is, a, again, it was identified as a life safety matter. Um, and I think that this is a great project for us to work on again during a potential closure in the future. Um, as the building will need to go offline to have all this electrical work completed, um, it would be best handled um, as an opportunity when the library may potentially be closed to the public. Um, so anyway, I'm going to pause right there. And uh, um, if anyone else would like to add something more from the conversation last Thursday, um, I'd love to hear what your feedback is. There are a couple of things also to note about this report. It does not include some of the items that are in or have been in our, our uh, plan for um, use of reserve funds. It does not include, for example, the RFID project. It doesn't include um, updating the phone system uh, and some other things that, uh, you know, computers and so forth uh, that are legitimately capital expenditures. Um, this strictly focuses on the building and uh, the parking lot and the, ex and the grounds. Um, there are a couple of other things that um, came up during the uh, process of completing this report uh, because of the issues and concerns related to uh, the pandemic. Uh, the second category uh, has actually been consolidated and elevated somewhat. It deals with issues related to the occupational health uh, and safety for patrons and staff in the building. Um, in particular, there are some uh, water filtration issues that need to be evaluated uh, and corrected. If they are not corrected, they could lead to uh, problems with mold and other health hazards. Uh, there also are some things that um, uh, that need to be assessed for the roofing systems. We have 11 separate roofing surfaces on the building, um, and uh, we will in all probability want to engage uh, on the recommendation of our consultant, we're going to likely want to engage a, a roofing assessment to monitor when those roofing surfaces need to be updated. Uh, the two largest of those roofing areas we, um, we updated and incorporated into our 2016 project, uh, but there are some surfaces where there is, uh, there is ponding uh, and, uh, and issues of, of some repairs that need to be made, um, most likely not immediate, major repairs, but nonetheless, you have to monitor those things so that you don't find yourself responding to um, uh, a water infiltration issue when it's already elevated to become a serious problem. So the categories that are identified as one, two, and three in this report incorporate uh, the life safety issues, primarily the electrical issues, occupational health matters um, and the building system building and system integrity issues um, the um, uh, the principal next step is going to be for staff to uh, seek recommendations to get the engineering follow-up 
to determine what needs to be addressed. The electrical, of course, is first, um, and, uh, and the other issues are going to need to be uh, evaluated more thoroughly than what this study uh, was intended to do. So there are some additional steps that will occur in the next few meetings with recommendations for how to proceed especially on the electrical matters. The most likely reason why those electrical problems occurred was in response to some flooding issues we had a number of years ago before we um, redid the parking lot. We had an incident or a, a series of problems in which water was draining from the parking lot through the electrical vault into the building. And those corrections were made both the plumbing issues and the electrical issues on a temporary basis at the time. Um, and clearly in our last project, we did not reevaluate whether there were code requirements that needed to be met that hadn't been adequately addressed. The principal problem in the electrical, the, the electrical work might actually split into two phases. One is that we have um, too many uh, control boxes. Um, in the case of anyone who is doing electrical work in the building, there needs to, under the code, there needs to be a single uh, safety cutoff switch for power so that uh, everything is de energized out of one source. Um, and anyone unfamiliar with the um, current arrangement would have to, you know, would be at risk because there are actually two such locations um, in the present setup. And so in all probability, we're gonna be looking at um, upgrading uh, so that everything that needs to be um, shut down when electrical work is going on in the building is located on one control switch. Uh, the secondary issue is the uh, connectors. Some of the connectors are, um, are past their useful life. Some of them were manufactured by companies that no longer are in business and may be uh, substandard or not meet the code as a result. Uh, that issue may take a little time. We'll see what the recommendations are as to whether those two projects uh, should be done simultaneously, but the uh, control, um, uh, situation is the most urgent one, and that's the one that that's going to need to proceed uh, most quickly. If the two can be handled, the two sets of issues can be handled in one project, that would be fine. It might save us a little money, but we have to deal with the code violations first. Any other questions about the recommendations for this um, uh, for this study? Someone help me find it. I can't seem to find the report online on our website. So I'm sure it's there, but I'm I'm having trouble finding it. And the other question was, did if that uh, other meeting, which I wasn't able to attend, was uh, a Zoom meeting, can we put that on the uh, our YouTube channel as well, please? Uh, the document you're looking for is attachment seven, um, as noted on the agenda. <coughs> Maybe we could put that in a more prominent place for folks um, since it's such an important document somewhere under. It's in draft form. We put it up there for now, but we'll be happy to put it in a more prominent position, I think, when it's in, out of draft. Um, well, I don't know. Pretty big report, so that'd be my suggestion, but it's in attachment seven, Anthony. That's right. Thank you. And so, um, is that eight million dollars in twenty twenty dollars? Do you think that the report calls for? There's a three percent escalation that's assigned for each year, and so the years that are are out um, for work that's going to be for work that's going to be done in, in twenty thirty would have ten years worth of um, escalation assigned to it based on uh, construction estimates. That's yes, it's eight million and twenty twenty dollars. No, um, 
what, what the price, the replacement prices that you're seeing for the year in which the work is being called for has an escalation that's assigned to it. There's a, there's a figure of 3% that is added to today's price for something in 2030. That's my understanding. Ron, does that, is that match your understanding? Other trustees present that heard um, yeah. Joe's report, is that your understanding? Yes. Well, basically, okay, there's a, there is a, an engineering concept of future value that is not specifically incorporated into these projections. What these projections are, in, are based on is depending on how far out the report indicates that a particular project would need to occur, they have incorporated into the estimated cost a 3% per year escalation, escalation in what those costs would be in today's dollars. However, when we get to the point of actually proceeding with projects that are be more than five years old, we will have to evaluate what the actual costs are at that time as we're proceeding none of this work will ever be done strictly on the basis of this report. This is a guideline for indicating what needs our attention in the future and where the engineering studies and the, um, the architectural work needs to begin for any of these projects. So for example, um, the electrical work that needs to proceed um, as soon as we can, can do it, uh, those costs are gonna be pretty close to what these estimates are, but they are not representative of what contractors might bid to actually do the work. They are our, our consultant's best estimate of what this work might cost. Um, the projects that are proposed for you know, five and 10 and 15 years out may cost us substantially less if the escalation rates are lower or if materials costs have shifted down, but typically they don't shift in that direction. So this is basically a planning document. It is backed up. You'll find on the, on, uh, the two pages immediately preceding page 12 in the report uh, is a two page sample worksheet which lays out the level of detail that this information is based on and as we work our way through the various activities that are represented or af after we correct something um, this matrix is a working document that staff can update and maintain and it generates new cost estimates for each of these. So for example, if we repair, if we do the electrical work, that will, that will uh, put a 2020 or 2021 date for when that was updated. And the, um, the next time when this might need our attention is already embedded in the matrix. So if, for example, the expected life of the electrical panel is 20 years, it will tell us that 20 years out, we'll need to take a look at that. Similarly, for the various roofing surfaces that we have, when we fix one, it goes into a, it changes the uh, date you see in about column five or six, that those dates represent the year when those particular surfaces uh, were installed. Um, when we when we update one of those, it will change to the year in which it was done, and the matrix recalculates when we need to look at it again. It also recalculates or forecasts what the cost might be. So you know this is a living document. It's a working uh, spreadsheet that enables us to keep track of future needs uh, on an ongoing basis, rather than as simply a snapshot of what things are as of right now. So this is a tool for planning in the future. Um, we're going to start with the projects that um, are indicated as life safety issues 
and then we'll look at the occupant health issues and uh, building and system integrity issues that show up in the first five years to evaluate what should be done next in carrying out the plans that already are fairly well represented in our uh, reserve plans, our reserve uh, funding plans, but now we'll be able to update that with, a, with an anchor to a much more detailed projection tool. So, you know, that's really, that's, those are steps that will follow. Um, you know, but the, you know, this is a resource document for us. This is not a final cost estimate for what any of these projects will actually require. That will come from our bid process and working with the architects and engineers who help us plan these projects in more detail. And if I could add to that, um, if you are to look on page, um, it is the page of the snapshot of the workbook, of the Excel workbook, and there are columns and it goes from about 17 to 29. And this question was asked during the, the meeting. And if you if you want to go to like if you look at the titles of each of those, 24, let's say to 29, you're able to change some of these assumptions. And for example, 27 and 28, I recall um, the consultant letting us know that 27 and 28 taken it into account inflation rate. They take into account um, the average um, market rate for some of these um, um, uh, costs of, of contracting services. Um, and so, like Ron said, this is a, a worksheet, a workbook that's certainly able to be um, adjusted with the current year information and the consultant is willing to work with us to give us some of that information, we can give the consultant the information if we know it best. So it really is a, a very, it tries to be a very, you know, as, as accurate as possible for us to, to base our decisions on. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say it's um, wonderful to have, it's clearly, um, massive step up in any document I've ever seen that uh, lays out our capital needs in the future. So I'm uh, grateful to have it. As I read it, Anthony, maybe you could tell me if this is your read as well, the sort of the heart of it looks to me to be on page 12, which is that they suggest we may want to spend a little bit more than $2 million in the next five years, uh, but that we're basically looking to spend uh, either half a million or a third of a million every year on capital costs for the foreseeable future. Uh, is that about your takeaway that that's about what we're the consultant suggests we may need to do to keep the building running? I think that's what we're seeing in this this page, the anticipated annual capital repair and major maintenance costs for the next you know twenty to forty years, uh, twenty years rather, sorry, <laughs> um, up to the year twenty forty. Um, yes, you can see what the averages are here in the spinal column. Again, um, the primary costs are, are really here at the top. Uh, these are the things that um, are recommended that we take care of sooner than later. Uh, again, we talked about the life safety issues being the electrical and the water um, matters. Those are really the things that are nested in these two columns here. Um, yes, I think that's a fair assessment about what our commitments are. And this is something that we could spend out of our capital reserve fund, which I think has, correct me if I'm wrong, $6 million in it today. That's correct. So the consultant, and again, it's a wonderful report. I appreciate your leadership at uh, you know, procuring it and getting it done. Uh, calls for, it looks like 2.2 .2 million to spend in the next five years, which we certainly have out of our $6 million, that'd be a good use of our money to spend it on. That's sort of the takeaway from the report. Is that about right? Yes, I would say so. Now, Great. it's also possible that when we get through the engineering and design stages, we might find that if we um, attack uh, more of these activities or projects 
at one time in a single project that some of these costs may go down. For example, if we, if we address the first five years in a single project, the escalation costs that are embedded in some of these projections uh, would be lower. Well, heck, we could do it for the next 10 years, right? We could do almost all of it if we had to. So maybe it's the cheapest way to do it. Well, it may not be given the fact that the useful life of some of these things don't come up until 2027 uh, means that we don't need to proceed with some of those efforts right away. Um, I would say that most of the things that are in the first five-year group, though, might be appropriate to proceed with uh, in a single project. That's part of what we need to gather more information about before we're prepared to make that recommendation. Would we need additional information or is that why we hired this guy? Well, this is a first cut. Uh, for example, if we're proceeding with the electrical work in the life safety category, we need to gather the engineering specifications to request bids. I don't know that this project includes enough detail to move immediately to that step. Uh, once we have determined what the, spe the specifications are, then we'll need to go out for bid to electrical contractors who are qualified to do the work. Okay. So I, I, there are numerous steps to proceed through this process in order to make any of these exceptions. Last I, Lisa, last question for me. May. Please, because we're moving on because we want to stay on time. And I think a lot of this is going to cover, but we appreciate Thank your you. interest. Uh, I know Anthony is an excellent director, but being a general contractor, it's unlikely to be in his uh, particular skill set. Um, I hope it is something we'll be thinking about given the scope of this, these needs, what sort of resource we might bring to bear to uh, you know, get these projects out in the street. Uh, as much as possible in the way that, um, you know, he successfully brought in a consultant for the outdoor stuff. Uh, hopefully That's why he's, some recommendations. Excuse me for a minute, Dan. That's why he's looking at Inberg Anderson and some others to put it out, pull it all together to put out to bid. So it would be this guy to- Well, no, he may it. be looking at some others, but I think he's recommending him based on prior work, but he may look at some others. I think Anthony can best answer that question. But I think he's going to look to make sure it's competitive and I think there's a comfort level working with him. Anthony? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, I feel pretty confident that Joe's already got an assessment about what, what type of work needs to be done here. He's already done a, a good degree of the legwork that we could, we could certainly tap him for this emergency work that needs to be done. Um, as I said at the top of all of this conversation, I think we have an opportunity cost. Um, we've got a rare situation where the library might be might be closed for a period of time here in the near future. And in an effort to reduce impact to um, public service and the staff, it would be great if we just had something in our back pocket that we could just pull out and say, all right, here we're closed again, and we've got a contractor, and he's got drawings, and um, we're ready to get going. Um, so I'd, that would be my ideal situation. Um, obviously, I don't think that's the appropriate way to approach for everything that's in this plan. Uh, but for this initial stuff that's more of an emergency matter, um, I think it would be a wise approach to take. But I really, I'd love to hear your perspective and, and to take direction from you about how you'd like to see this proceed. I mean, if I may, my take is anything's better than having that $6 million draw a percent and a half in the bank. So if we've got work to do, let's convert that $6 million into hard assets to that we have to spend anyway. So the faster we spend the money on capital needs, the better. We'll be judicious in whatever we spend. Yeah, I agree. And I think that like Anthony and Ron said, we have the ability to bid these projects. We have the ability as trustees to approve the project. You know, so there's gonna be a lot of information, you know, and, and that you'll see Dan, before, you know, before we, we cut a check. <laughs> and everything has to go out to competitive bid anyway, after a certain amount anyway, which is what Inberg Anderson would be doing. Can we move on to the director's report at this time? I agree. Okay, thank you all. 
Um, you've got my director's report behind attachment eight, and mm -hmm. I will give you a summary of our activity for the past month in July. It's been a very busy month for us inside the building um, as we're balancing both what we're doing digitally and now um, what we're doing inside the building. Um, as well as what we're doing out in the community. So the first item is um, our strategic plan updates. And as you can see, we've got a picture there from another one of our partnerships with the Park District. And that is um, a new installation that we've got at Mallinckrodt Park called the Riddle Walk. Um, mm -hmm. We're really excited about that process. Um, has anyone here had a chance to walk through Mallinckrodt this summer and take a look at the new Riddle Walk? It's almost a, a riddle to try, try to say that as a tongue twister. <laughs> We love it, Anthony. My family, the Riddle family, loves <laughs> loves seeing those, and we've tried to come up with our own, and the it's just been super fun. We we've, we've loved it. Yay! Awesome. I've walked through too, uh, Trusty Fishman. It's very delightful. It's very yeah. sweet. Thank you. Cool. We're trying to give some folks some activity to do this summer and to get out and about in a safe way and at a safe distance. And we're grateful for the Park District for allowing us to, uh, to set up shop there. Um, speaking of partnerships, another project that is in a fledgling state right now that is ready to discuss briefly is a partnership that we're exploring with District 39. Um, this is also listed on page one of my report. Um, so Youth Services Manager Andrea Johnson and I have been meeting with um, officials at District 39 in an effort to provide greater access to our ebook collections. Um, D39 has made an investment in their ebook services and they're really obviously promoting digital collections and digital curriculum this year. So um, there's a product that's available through Overdrive called Sora which is a new interface for public schools and it also allows an opportunity for um, allied uh, public library districts um, that share similar boundaries to um, list their holdings uh, in the school's um, digital uh, collections. So essentially when I log in as a student of District 39, um, I can see which items are available in my District 39 catalog and I will also be automatically logged into the holdings of the Wilmette Public Library. So as a student, I can see all the resources that the school has purchased for me that support my curriculum, but I can also see what the public library is offering to support my curriculum as well as enhance my leisure reading and winning books and so on and so forth. Um, we see this as a great way of trying to do better digital marketing and promotion of our collections. Um, this, our students are the same. We, we share one another. Um, it's just another way to promote the collections that we have. Um, so we've, we've initiated this process and we're going to be exploring to see um, how this takes off and if our digital usage continues to rise as a result of this additional visibility. Um, so primarily the collections that are going to be visible are those that are of interest to children. So it will be our youth collections. Um, you're not going to, when you're logged in as a student, you're not going to see, you know, like James Patterson adult books, but you'd see James Patterson kids books, that sort of thing. Um, this is new. Um, it's, it's in a test phase. We'll see how well this works, um, but we're really excited about this partnership. Um, any questions about that? That's great, dear Anthony. This is Dan. Um, as I'm sure everybody knows, there's going to be a lot of remote learning for District 39. Uh, they're spending a fortune on subscribing to all sorts of digital products for the kids to you know, try to learn. And so the more we can be nimble and help the district, particularly with reading uh, live classes, because as you might know, the district um, isn't really in a position to offer that much in terms of live instruction. It's rather limited. Um, most of the learning is asynchronous, which is, you know, somebody posts what you're supposed to do and then the kid is supposed to go and do it and post it on the uh, platform, which they haven't used Seesaw. So the, the more that we can step up and offer more live learning opportunities for especially our focus of reading, but even basic math, there's an enormous demand for it in the community. So I'm glad to see this partnership start. and. If there's ever a time to hit the gas on it, it would be in the next uh, few months. Thank you, Dan. Um, all right, Could so I interrupt? Oh, go ahead, Jen. Sorry. Could I interrupt for just a minute? Um, 
I could, could I ask Trustee Riddle what time she joined the meeting so I can put it in my notes? Seemed like it was, I, I don't know the exact time. But when I looked at the clock, it said 720, I'm sorry, not 724, 624. That's what I had. Okay, okay. thanks. And, uh, and a comment, just to back up for a minute, a comment to Dan. If uh, the Wilmette Public Library had been about whittling down the capital reserve in the last few years and trying to do it quickly, uh, we would not have the reserve that we have now for things that are urgent and almost emergencies that need to be done. So I don't prescribe to the to the idea of let's spend the capital reserve fund as soon as we can and as much as we can. That's just a difference of opinion. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Okay, um, back to the director's report for a, a couple minutes here. Um, uh, so digital collections, bridging off of what I was talking about before, um, obviously, as I mentioned earlier in my statistics for, for July, um, we have seen exponential growth in our e-resources and we continue to see that. Um, I again want to thank you all for your support in enhancing the budget this year for our digital resources. Um, as I mentioned at last month's meeting, um, there is a merger that's ahead of um, uh, uh, I've, I've lost my train of thought. Overdrive has acquired RB Digital. Okay, I think I mentioned that last month, um, and this is forthcoming now. So RB Digital is the platform that historically has provided digital magazines for our patrons, as well as e-audiobooks and a select number of audiobooks. And uh, this platform um, is very popular with our users, but it certainly doesn't carry the brand recognition as Overdrive and Libby uh, do. So the Libby app will now incorporate everything that was in the um, RB Digital collection. And we're moving forward with that and marketing of that uh, acquisition is gonna be going forward here shortly. Uh, so all of those resources that we've already subscribed to and paid for through RB Digital will soon become available on the Libby platform. So if you're not already familiar with Libby, I would strongly encourage you to do so because that collection is growing at a very fast rate and will soon get a whole bunch of really exciting new titles uh, that you may not have already seen there. Um, at the same time, um, our digital services staff is also looking at additional collections that are currently not available in digital format, anticipating that there will be increased demand for those. And the ones that we're looking at right now also include the addition of resources like Value Line. Some of our business newsletters um, have historically only been available in print and their electronic platforms have been <clears throat> maybe less desirable. They, they don't deliver the same results. Um, we're looking to get, we're get, looking to get subscriptions to those in electronic format to serve our patrons who are really missing access to those uh, kind of newsprint related um, financial newsletters. So stay tuned for that. Um, in terms of the physical collections, a lot of activity has been taking place here behind the scenes this last month. I mean, technical services has processed so many materials. Um, a lot of things that were um, uh, building up um, within our storage facilities over the course of the last three months, they've plowed through all of those things and have got them out to the public um, very quickly, and we're excited about that. Um, that's also required us to be pretty nimble in terms of shifting collections around. So. Um, we have been moving, um, uh, like for example, our science fiction uh, collection has moved over to the fiction room. Um, we're shifting a lot of our collections. So um, just be aware that some things are gonna be moving a bit um, and we're marking all of those with, uh, with labels on the end caps. Um, yada, yada, yada. I could get into a lot of detail. What can I pull out here? Um, we're trying to make it easier for, for our users to be able to access things without needing to shop with inside the library. Um, so we're doing a lot of grab-and-go type um, situations for, for both adults and kids. We've got grab-and-go kits um, for STEAM, um, and we're offering those both in person and at contactless pickup in the parking lot. Um, our summer reading program has been going like gangbusters, despite the fact that we've been closed the better part of the summer. Um, we're still going on right now, so I don't have final numbers for you, but um, our numbers are trending very strongly. Um, in youth services, at the date of writing here, we had 463 participants. 
Um, at the same time last year, it was about 700 some. So we're, I think we're, we're doing pretty, pretty well. Um, over in adult services, we're actually seeing really great um, results. Well, we've only received 96 submissions. That was far more than we've received at the end of last year. Um, so adults are really taking to this digital format, and we're excited about that. As far as youth services go, um, I want to go back to that for a moment. We're conducting a survey for all the finishers of our summer reading program and asking an, a number of questions about what kinds of material services and programs families need this fall, uh, given the modified environment. And we're taking all that information and helping to inform what we're going to be doing um, with our programming and services going forward. Um, so to date, um, we had 67 responses, and we're going to use that information to help shape our fall programming and services. Um, I want to let you know that we've got a lot of special projects going on uh, simultaneously. So. Um, the next big project that we're working on is the Telephone System Replacement Project. That's our partnership with the Village of Wilmette and the Wilmette Park District. Um, we all are in the market for a new phone system and recognizing the economy of scale, we all went out to bid together looking for a similar system. Um, they will all be independently managed, but we know that we can get group pricing um, by working together. So um, we've received all of our bids, bidding is closed on that, and we're in the arduous task of trying to analyze over 60 different responses to that and try to determine which solution is going to be best for us. So uh, that analysis is ongoing right now. We anticipate that when the time comes, um, it, we will likely see installation of that new system um, later this fall, probably November or thereabouts. Um, but we'll certainly be bringing that before you as soon as we've got a proposal to share with you all. Um, concurrent with that, uh, next week I anticipate uh, posting the um, RFP for the radio frequency identification tagging project. Uh, I've been working closely with staff in technical services, circulation, and digital services to try to get this thing posted up. Um, excited about the opportunity to work on that over the winter. Uh, so again, the timeline for that will be to post it um, next week. Hopefully have a recommendation to present to you all in um, either at the September meeting or the October meeting with an anticipated start date for this to be probably November, December, and then probably about five months or more to um, individually tag every item in our collection. We've got about 350,000 items that will need to be handled and cataloged. Uh, so stay tuned for more information about the RFP for RFID. And then the other RFP that we're working on, you'll see referenced on page eight of my report, and that is on our website um, renovation project. This one is still very much in its planning stages, and I really, I haven't even seen the draft of the report yet, so um, just know that this is something that's in the works, and we hope to have a new website um, up uh, by, I would say, probably the summer of next year. It's about a six-month process to develop a new website. So just to keep you posted on that activity. And Anthony, one of the one of the uh, parameters that you're looking at is to make sure that the board and the board documents are far more visible to the public. So it'll be a lot more easier with the new website to do things like have the capital asset project. Yeah, I mean, and not just that. I mean, I, I think all of our meeting things. materials, we can we all agree that the, the methodology that we post our materials by could be more transparent. Um, there's certainly a lot of opportunity to improve the way that that data is posted and the way the documents are managed on the website. Um, but the, the, the website is definitely dated and is in need of improvement. Uh, there's a lot of things that staff um, in the middle of the pandemic wish that we could do with the website that we were not able to do. Um, so uh, we've got quite a wish list that we've acquired and we're working through that right now. So yes, the, the end is in sight and we will have a wonderful website when this is all said and done. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, what else can I tell you briefly? Okay. You put in your report in terms of your progress, in terms of your recruitment, or you want to leave that alone? Sure. I mean, I can talk about that briefly. As I, as I mentioned before, um, one of the real challenges that we've had ever since March um, has been our staffing model. Um, one of the great successes of our organization is that we retain our staff for a long time. Um, the average tenure of our team is well over 20 years. Um, and that means that um, a number of our staff were expecting retirement point in the next 
you know, present to the next three to five years. And I think the circumstances of 2020 have led a number of people to decide to make that decision sooner than later. As a result, we've seen about a 10% reduction in our workforce over the course of the last couple months. And um, we've seen some key positions um, vacated as a result of that. Our circulation manager position um, became vacant this past month. Um, that's certainly one of the key roles um, in the middle of our, of our pandemic planning was to escalate circulation and get physical materials back out. So the timing of that was unfortunate, but we're doing a great job with the interim leadership of the assistant manager, Mark Sigelsk. Um, we have collected all of our applications for that, and we are in the review process of our applications for the circulation manager position. The other position that's a key management position that was vacated is our building uh, manager. So facilities um, now has a vacant position as well. Uh, that is currently collecting applications and we're hoping to complete review of that here um, within the next couple weeks. And uh, my goal will be to have that position hired as soon as possible. As due to some restructuring, um, we have, we've kind of uh, added some additional duties and responsibilities related to the facility and security manager position. It's a new title, new set of responsibilities, and part of that is due part and parcel to our capital reserve study, recognizing that we've got a lot more maintenance activity and more reporting that's going to be necessary going forward. So those are all some additional duties that we're enhancing as we move forward with that managerial position. Uh, we also have a couple vacancies in the adult services department for librarians. Um, so you can expect to see some new faces um, helping out in adult services soon, too. Um, but that's kind of kind of where we're at with recruitment um, for the key roles at the moment. Um, and I think I'll pause there. And if you've got any further questions for me, I'd be more than happy to to get into it. I have a comment. This is Jan Barshis again. I want to congratulate you, particularly Anthony, on getting the telephone system placement in place along with the village and the park district. I think that must be a brand new partnership. And I think hopefully it will continue to provide benefit for all of us. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah, it's been really great working with those guys. It's really nice to, to have that, that, those, those uh, channels open. Mm -hmm. Jan kind of stole my thunder, but um, I was glad to hear that as well. Uh, wondering also if for the building facilities manager, you've looked at uh, any expertise from the village or the park district with their staff that manages their facilities as well. And second one, and I'll ask you to respond to them both in whatever order you'd like. I think we talked about the website um, maybe a year ago, how many of these library websites are, you know, kind of pretty similar and they, a lot of them have similar backends. Are there any other libraries that are doing similar you know, website renovations in the age of the pandemic that would be worth looking at partnerships with some other libraries as well? Um, all right, so I'll speak first to the website question since that's fresh. Um, I would say that, you know, our site is unique to us. Um, so, yes, it's true that there, there are some certain analogies between agencies and we're going to borrow um, some ideas that we're seeing in other libraries. As far as the actual um, back-end management of our own individual site and making it usable for our team, um, it's only going to be used by Wilmette Library staff. So this is going to be specific just to our team. Having been through two website renovations in the past, um, it's, a, it's an arduous process to work um, with a designer uh, to meet all the individual needs that we have. Um, and with the criteria that we've got, that I think the economy of scale in this one really, I think it would have diminishing returns if we were to try to partner with someone else. And I, I am not aware of anyone else that we would be eligible to partner with at this time. Um, we're already far down that road that I, I don't think that there's an opportunity there. Um, it's, that's an interesting suggestion, um, um, but one I think that, at least for this particular project, is not practical. Um, so, you know, I, I think we will continue to think like that and see what opportunities we have to partner. Uh, this is just one of those areas that it just didn't seem like it was going to work out for us this time. Um, your other question was about uh, the facilities manager and looking at partnerships um, or looking at um, other local government entities to see if there were folks on those teams that might be able to help us out. Um, I can tell you, I, I did mention this, I meet regularly with other um, executive leaders within uh, our community, 
And obviously, um, we, we certainly want to let folks know um, if, if we've got any vacancies, if they know someone on their team who already knows our community, maybe already knows our facility, um, that they can vouch for. I mean, that's frankly, that's how we got our finance manager, John Risco, who is no longer on our call, but um, <laughs> that's kind of how we recruited John. Um, so I, I ran the flag um, up the pole there with, with the team again and said, hey, if you know anyone, um, please encourage them to, uh, to apply. So um, we've advertised in a number of places, and so far we've got some pretty good response. So um, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get the right fit for this role, too. Um, whether they come from um, one of our allied agencies in, the, in Wilmette or from another library in the area. I have a question about staff, too. This is Jan <coughs> Barshas again. Um, will Cynthia McMillan's spot be replaced, or has, has, have you already done that? Uh, no, we have not done that yet, and um, we're still analyzing that role for, um, for needs. Um, we're still okay. looking at administration about um, how our duties are 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 working out so um, mm -hmm. one we haven't advertised yet but I miss it I miss Cynthia oh yes <laughs> thanks uh, anything else on your minds okay uh, can we move to committee reports and uh, first trustee Barshi so you have a update for the ILA? Uh, yes, there are a number of things. Uh, there will be an ILA virtual conference this year, as I'm sure everybody would figure. Uh, there is a, a lot of trustee programming. The date is October 20 to 22nd, and they uh, advertise a strong schedule of program programming for trustee attendees, and the opening session will start at noon on October 20th. Um, a couple of articles that I think are just deserving of mention. Um, there's something called Libraries That Listen, and I think that's what our library is really working towards at this point. Um, it's Skokie Library has actually put this into practice. Uh, they use the Harwood Institute approach, which emphasizes turning outward to reorient the community. And something like Mellencrot, um, I think, is a perfect example of that. But that's the idea that to do anything lasting, and this is just an interesting comment, you need to do it in partnership with others. Otherwise, it will not stay around. Um, one thing that's really exciting is that PBS is going to broadcast a television special featuring the Library of Congress National Book Festival. This program, Celebrating American Ingenuity, is Sunday, September 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time and Pacific Time. Um, it will include two new entry points for audiences across the country for the first time. It's going to be a national television special on PBS stations and an interactive experience online for this 20th year. The Stations will broadcast the Library of Congress National Book Festival, which sounds really exciting for anybody who loves books. It's called Celebrating American Ingenuity, a two-hour program featuring some of the nation's most renowned authors and literary voices on um, the television special. The book festival will reach an even bigger audience of book lovers during these challenging times. They're collaborating with PBS and public broadcast stations across the country to present this television special, said Librarian of Congress, Carla Hagen. The broadcast will follow a weekend of virtual festivities online, which will be accessible. You can pick this up on the ILA website, but um, on loc.gov slash bookfest, including on-demand videos, live author chats and discussions, options to personalize your own journey through the festival with timely topics and book buying poss possibilities. The library is collaborating with PBS Books and it's primetime special connecting people who write great books with the people who love to read them. So it seems that it's really exciting. There are many, uh, many authors 
the writers Walter Isaacson, Sandra Cisneros, and Amy Tan will offer thought-provoking commentary on how American ingenuity has led this nation through the best and worst of times, and how that spirit has helped guide our journey toward a more perfect union. So if you have a chance, be sure to put it on your calendar and uh, try to attend. I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful experience. The um, last article I have to tell you about, this is the color commentary point of my report. Um, there was a book that was taken out from the Monroeville Public Library 43 years ago. And the book was The Man Who Saved Robinson Crusoe by James Poling. Well, it was returned on Tuesday, the exact same day that it was, the exact same date as when it was taken out on August 4th, 1977 was when it was taken out and it was returned Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. And nobody knows quite where it came from, uh, but it might have come back because it was just in the previous few weeks that the Monroe Library went fine free. So if the book showed up because of that, it was an added bonus. Anyway, that's just the fun part. Okay, well, thank you. And, uh -huh. just, is that, and just to let you know, generally the trustee forum is the last day of the Illinois um, Library Conference and they've not put the schedule up, but that's okay. where Ron will get his award for trustee oh, yeah. of the year at okay. that time virtually. Great. Okay. Rails, what's happening, Anthony? Direct off. Um, I would just direct you to take a look at the COVID page on Rails. Um, it's right on the front page of railslibraries.info. Um, you'll, you'll find all the latest information from the Realm study. There was more additional information posted today. Um, Rails has not taken official position on any of the updates on that study regarding quarantine and materials, but um, there's still you know, a lot of very useful information posted there if that's the sort of thing that you're after. Um, Rails has also created a new Pulse page. That's what they call these um, specific topic-oriented pages that affect the system. Uh, the new Pulse page is um, on equity, diversity, and inclusion, which as you know is one of our key um, strategic plan points. Um, and a number of our libraries obviously are following that suit as well. So I would encourage you all to take a look at that as well um, as we're going to be leaning on that um, in the coming months, um, certainly more. So that's all I've got at this time. We've already announced the conference. Uh, then you've got communication and uh, in terms of information items and director, right before the meeting, you sent the thank you note from the mother and the son, mother and child, I don't know if it was boy or girl, who uh, took shelter during the what, tornado watch. Do you, did everybody see that? And so I no. think that's the only form of communication that has been received. Oh. That was an unusual um, afternoon um, when we had the tornado warning here last week. Um, the sky turned green and um, we, the weather radios went off and we enacted our tornado warning procedures and we evacuated the library down to the lower level, kept everyone safe and it's a scary time. It's a scary world for, for a lot of folks and for, for little ones it was, it was hard and, and this, this little guy was having a hard time but we did what we could to try to keep him calm and um, he appreciated that so he wrote us a note. Um, but that's all, that's all the correspondence that I've got to share tonight. That's great. You're muted, Lisa. Okay, we've already talked about the ILA conference and there's information on the agenda. In terms of new business, all the trustees should have gotten a letter from the accountant requesting uh, for you to fill out the form. So please take do that as soon as possible so that, that we can get a timely audit. Thank you. Any other new business? Old? Old business? Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Oh. 
Okay, so Dan moved that we adjourn at 7.25. Trustee Rogers seconded the motion. All in, any discussion? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.